You're listening to the Blog Talk Radio Network. Welcome to Radio Free Spirit, a place to learn ways to set your spirit free in all areas of your life with clarity, inspiration, commitment, and passion. Come in, relax, and bring your heart to today's journey. Hosted by a relationship and life transition coach, Jeff Lawton. And today's guest, uh, who I'm thrilled to have on the show today, uh, largely because he's a friend of mine, but also because I just think he's got incredible uh, work to offer the world. Um, he is uh, someone who was suffering from what had been diagnosed, and, and he'll correct me when he comes on uh, if I've got it wrong, but he had been diagnosed at various times with ADD, suffered with depression for a number of years, um, chronic fatigue syndrome, bipolar disorder. All of these issues were issues that he had been grappling with earlier in his life. And the traditional medical um, psychiatric route had proven to be not very satisfactory for him. And so he decided to take matters into his own hands and began researching how he could heal himself. And so um, I want to introduce author and uh, teacher Jeffrey Wilson. He's the author of the book Irrational Medicine, The Antidepressant Crisis and How to Avoid Unnecessary Behavioral Drugs and also worked for a time in the pharmaceutical in- industry. So from the uh, the wilds of Ohio, I'd like to welcome Jeffrey Wilson. Hi, Jeff. Hello. Hello. How are you? I am good. Welcome to the show, and, and thank you for making the time to be with us today. Oh, it's my absolute pleasure. I appreciate the opportunity. So um, let's just dive right in to... Um, Sharing, you know, regular listeners to the show, you know, they're a bit familiar, I think, with the fact that I had one career for many, many years and kind of switched horses in my mid-30s into my coaching and healing work that I do. And so I really like to always begin with first having my guests share a bit about your story, particularly the story that um, is about a transformation from one one life to another. And so if you don't mind, why don't you share with our listeners a bit about the story of how what you were doing before you began really seriously moving into this healing path that you're on and and uh, and a little bit about your journey with the depression. Yeah, sure. Um it's 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 a it's a pretty detailed story, so I'll give you a real high level. But mm-hmm. uh, but basically, when I was in uh, in college, uh, I came home my freshman year, and my parents had divorced, and my brother had died all within a six month period. Mm-hmm. Uh, that shoved me into a terrible terrible depression. And at the time, I went to my medical doctor, and I said, all I want to do is lay on the couch, watch television, and eat. And I'm not interested in, in being involved in life. And he looked at me. He says, oh, you're suffering from depression. Now, keep in mind, this is in 1978. Mm-hmm. So back then, it wasn't as prevalent as it is today. And we didn't, we didn't hear about it as much. And he says, uh, and I said, well, depression, what is that? And he goes, well, don't worry about it. It's a biochemical imbalance in the brain. And we have pills now that will give you and it will balance you out and then you'll be okay. Well, I took the medicine and didn't ask questions, didn't even bother to investigate, and that started me on my path. And that kept me on a path of pharmaceutical drugs for 23 years. So the next 23 years of my life, it was a series of ups and downs. And the pills would work for a little bit of time, and I'd get some kind of benefit to it, and then the pills would begin to wear off. And then I would go back to my doctor, and he would up the dosage, and then finally it got to the point where my medical doctor was no longer um, satisfied or comfortable prescribing the medicine at the level I was taking it. He sent me to a psychiatrist. 
and that put me in a whole different realm. Uh, and the, so the story repeated itself. I mean, the dosage got increased, and then the benefit wore off, and then they would swap out medicines. So for 23 years, I went from uh, psychiatrist to psychiatrist as I moved, you know, in my job. Uh, I would have to change doctors, and, you know, all the doctors would come up with a new medicine or a new cocktail or whatever. But eventually the story was always the same. The medicine would eventually quit working if I got any any benefits, benefits out of it at all. Uh, some medicines I got no benefits and only the side effects. Uh, for example, Prozac caused me to uh, want to commit suicide. I mean, it was terrible. Uh, and I got that story over and over on several of the different medications. So for 23 years, my dosage kept creeping up. Uh, and then the doctors began to uh, add additional medicines. Rather than taking me off of medication, they would just add on top of it. And then eventually, I, be, beyond the description of depression, I was then diagnosed with bipolar disorder. I was then diagnosed with ADD. I then went through a bout of chronic fatigue syndrome. And toward the end of my um, uh, t toward the end of this run, of uh, this 23 years, I was taking five drugs a day. Mm. I was, and two of them were antidepressants. One was an anti-anxiety medicine. One was uh, Ritalin for adult ADD, mm -hmm. and then another one was Buspar for anxiety. And so I was spending uh, set over $700 a month for my legal drug habit, <laughs> mm -hmm. and it literally was a legal drug habit. Right. Um, and so $700 a month for my drug habit, and I wasn't really getting any benefit. I was actually to the point where I was just suicidal all the time because after 23 years, this had war on my body physically, mentally, emotionally, and I was numbed out to the world. I, I, I had no feelings anymore. And um, I had an uh, uh, incident happen. Uh, a couple things went on for me, actually, that kind of woke me up. To additional possibilities and one of them was uh, December of one year uh, I called my psychiatrist and I got the message that he was out of town he had decided to take a vacation so I panicked and I thought well see with Ritalin you've got to have a prescription every month you just can't get refills mm -hmm. so I panicked and I took all my medicine all five prescriptions and I laid them out on the table and I figured out I had enough pills to survive <laughs> now, this is very, very much like a drug addict does it. I didn't realize this, but in retrospect, as I was writing the book and going through all this, it, it, it woke me up even further, and I, I said, wow, I can't believe I was really this bad. But laid out all my pills, counted them, counted the days on the calendar until my doctor would come back into town and I could get a new prescription. And uh, I figured out if I halved my dosages, if I just took half of the normal pills I took on a daily basis, that would probably get me through until my doctor was back into town. Now, being to give you an idea of the state of mind I was in, at no time did it occur to me to call his backup and go to another doctor and get a refill that way. I was so single-minded and so focused on I have these pills, I need them to survive, because that's what I was told over and over and over throughout the 23-year period, that I would never get off the drugs, that I needed them to survive. And... So that was my mindset, and that he was my savior, my doctor. You know, he's the one that I have to get my prescriptions from. I have to, I have to survive and hold on until he returns. That was my mindset. Mm -hmm. So I, that's what that's what my plan was. I cut my dosages in half, and something very odd happened right away. <clears throat> All of a sudden, I began to have more energy. All of a sudden, I began to be. Uh, begin to participate in life and all of a sudden I began to feel something now this was quite unique in 23 years I had been pretty well numbed out to the world you know I go through the motions I see a pretty puppy and I just see a pretty puppy you know I don't feel the beauty of that animal or I see a sunset or I would see a sunset and I wouldn't take it in as that's tremendous it's beautiful that's the connection to the creator of all that is I would just go, wow, what an interesting sunset. On half the dosage, on half these pills, I began to feel that. I began to get a little inkling 
it's like a little flame inside of me began to ignite. And I began to go, what's this about? What's happening? So <clears throat> my doctor came back into town about two weeks later, and I was the first on his appointment list. I got right in, <clears throat> and I went in for my appointment. It's a typical 30-minute session, you know, and it's usually it's 20 minutes early because he just asks some questions, write a script, and then out the door for the next patient. Mm -hmm. But the way it started out, he asked me how I was, and I told him what I did. And I and he said, well, you never should have done that. that that's insane. You shouldn't have done that. And then I said, but why did I feel better? Why did I get some life back into me? Why could I feel things that I haven't felt in so many years? And he just totally ignored the question and went to his desk and plopped down and started writing out scripts. He wrote out five new scripts, handed them to me, and gave them to me and said, go get these filled immediately. So I walked out the door, and I was, I was mad. I was furious. I had some anger inside of me that just welled up, and it's like something is wrong. Why did I feel that way? Why wouldn't he answer my questions? So... Uh, I looked at the scripts and I thought, if I have to live on these drugs the rest of my life, I don't want to live anymore. I, I want it to be over with. So I'm choosing now to get off the pharmaceutical drugs and to find out what's going on. Mm -hmm. So I set that intention. And then another incident happened right on the heels of that, almost the very next day. My father gets very ill, very sick. First time he'd ever been sick in his lifetime. And we had to take him to the hospital. It turns out he had, uh, after several days of tests, uh, they discovered uh, heart problems and an aortic aneurysm and some kidney problems, right? And so this is a man who would never been sick a day in his life. So the, the surgeon said, here's what we want to do. We, his heart's very weak, we, and he needs two bypasses. So we need, we're going to do the two bypasses and get his heart strong, and then he'll be able to survive the surgery for the aortic aneurysm. So as a family, we all agreed to it. Surgery, surgery day comes. He goes to the surgery. Surgeon comes out. He explains to us what's going on. And he says, okay, uh, we did five bypasses on your father, and we clamped an aneurysm on the backside of his heart, and he still has an irregular heartbeat. And now our concern is that his heart is stronger and it's going to enlarge the aortic aneurysm. So that's possibly going to kill him. And right away, something went through my mind. It was like, wait a minute, just a, just a day ago, before we signed the consent form for the surgery, it was he needs two bypasses. Now you come back and tell us he had five and an aneurysm and an irregular heartbeat. And it was like the story did not add up. <clears throat> and I, was, I began to see this pattern over and over again of being told just enough information to go along with a treatment plan. And so when I began to question the doctor, uh, he, he didn't want to answer my questions. And so to make a real long story short, I ended up firing him from the case. And after several days, I had my dad transferred to another hospital and to another doctor. And the care there was marvelous at first, and then it went downhill. And then I began to get different stories from them. And they said, okay, the way we're going to do the aneurysm is that we're going to put a, uh, a stent in because he's not, uh, he's not uh, strong enough or he'd never survive actually going through an operation. A little voice in the back of my head said, you know, there's something more to this. You need to check into it. So I went and did my own research, and I found a hospital in Cleveland. It's the Cleveland Clinic. And I talked to the, a surgeon at the Cleveland Clinic, and he said, yeah, uh, you know, if you get your dad up here, we'll, we probably can work with him, and we would do surgery. And I said, well, wait a minute. That's not what the doctor down here says. And he says, yeah, but we do these things all the time. And so we're used to it, and we know who can, who can do it and who can't. So I got my dad on an airplane, had him, had him flown up to Cleveland. They did the surgery. They cut out the aorta, the aneurysm in the aorta, put it in a plastic tube. <clears throat> Afterwards, the doctor said, you know, if you had brought him up here in the first place, we could have done his heart and the aneurysm all in one surgery. 
and it would have saved him a lot of pain and effort and so forth and so on. And I look back at that whole series of events, and over the course of six months, that's how long it took my dad to go through this whole thing. I just gave, you know, a six-month story in, what, ten minutes. Mm-hmm. But what uh, what I noticed was a pattern. A pattern had developed, and over and over and over again, doctors only told me or gave me enough information to go along with the treatment plan that they were prescribing. For example, the two bypasses instead of the five. If I'd been told up front he needed five bypasses and he had an aneurysm and or an irregular heartbeat, I think I I know in retrospect I would have gone to looking. I would have gone to Cleveland Clinic probably right from the get-go. Uh, so, <clears throat> and, and this happened over and over, and I counted it. I counted it. I had fired like 28 different doctors in a six-month period. And some people accused me of doctor shopping. And I said, no, I, I wasn't doctor shopping. What I was doing was judging whether or not I was being told the truth and being told what was accurate for, for my father's condition. Because at any time, if I had made the wrong decision, the wrong choice, he would have died. And we were told he was going to die three or four different times throughout that six-month period. Mm-hmm. So, and then, but, and then, and then here's the, the big, the, the capper, <clears throat> okay? So... Cleveland Clinic, he goes to the surgery, and we noticed that they were, that he was, he would be sedated. And we thought he was sedated, and they, they told us, you know, he's just sleeping, he's recovering from the surgery. So, I checked his chart, and he, he was, he was being given the drug Haldol. And so, we decided it's time to move him back to Dayton. And uh, so we moved him back to Dayton, Ohio, and this time, instead of going to a hospital, he was still not strong enough. We had to put him in a recovery facility or slash a nursing home. And I would go in to visit my dad on a daily basis, and uh, I would go in, and he'd just be staring out the window. He would, Some days he would know who I was, some days he wouldn't. And I began, after a few days of this, I began to feel really guilty, and I began to think, well, my dad was a strapping man, never sick a day in his life. If I had known he was going to be a vegetable, that he'd be confined to a nursing home, I never would have fought so hard to save his life. And that made me feel really super guilty. And then that little voice goes off in the back of my head again. It says, check his chart. So I checked his chart, and there it was, Haldol. He was still being given Haldol. And I did some research on Haldol and discovered it's a psychotropic drug it's an antipsychotic used a lot often in schizophrenia, and it's to calm people down. So I, I asked his doctor, I said, why is my father being given Haldol? He's not depressed, he's not schizophrenic, he's none of those things. The doctor said, well, that's what he came from the Cleveland Clinic with. And I said, take him off of it. He said, oh, you can't do that. I said, bull. I used a little bit stronger language. I said, you know, <laughs> I said, take him off of it. So he did. And by now, I had gotten to the point where I was pretty demanding with a doctor. I I've, I've, I've developed in this six-month period, I developed an attitude that a doctor is really hired help. Just like a lawyer, just like a plumber, just like a landscape. I mean, they're more educated, but that doesn't make them right, and it doesn't make them God, and it doesn't give them rights and responsibilities to control my life or my family's life. I knew what was right for my father, and that was to get off the medicine. So this doctor removed the medicine. Next day, after six months, I walked into my dad's room. He's sitting up in bed. He's feeding himself. And he's dressed. And he had dressed himself. And he actually was able to get up, walk around, go to the bathroom, everything he could do six months prior to. And it was like a miracle. And it was because the Haldol had been taken out of his system. If that had, if, if that had not been taken out, he probably would still be in that nursing home today in a drug-induced coma, looking out the window, and I'd probably still feel even more guilty for what I had done. So that taught me another lesson. And when I walked out of the nursing home, the little voice in the back of my head said, okay, if that drug is so powerful that it did that to your father and kept him down like that, you're taking drugs in the same vein, all the antidepressants and everything else that I was on. What are they doing to you? So that combined with my own experience set me on a path of finding and searching for 
uh, alternative healers. And I decided then I was going to get real serious about it. And I went to, and I started doing hypnotherapy. I started doing um, Reiki. I started doing massage therapy. Anything and everything I could get my hands on, I tried it. And if it was beneficial, I continued to do it. If it didn't serve me or I didn't get a benefit out of it, I stopped it. But for the next uh, year, year and a half, I did every alternative treatment I could get my hands on. And I did a lot of release work, an emotional release, getting rid of emotions, getting rid of all the stuff that was keeping me depressed. And I did a lot of research on depression, what the true cause of it is, uh, what I did a lot of research on the drugs and so forth and found out all the reality behind the drugs and how they're created and so forth. And by the way, this was exactly the time that I was working for the world's largest pharmaceutical distributor. So if you, if you think God doesn't have a sense of humor, you know, here I am working inside the business and actually being a huge consumer of their product. Uh, so I had reached a point then where I went to a homeopathic physician and had gotten off the drugs, all five prescriptions, and I got tapered down very slowly. It's a very controlled descent, you know, off the, mm -hmm. off the drugs. Never, never, never go off these things cold turkey. It is dangerous. It is life-threatening. I want to say that right now. Never do this on your own. It sh you should always have help and a support team. I had a huge support team behind me. And well, I appreciate so, that you said that because I, I know people that have, done exactly that, you know, where they've gone cold turkey and they were lucky that it didn't have more catastrophic results, but I, I just want to get right behind your recommendation. Any listener who might be dealing with this issue, it is not a good idea to just stop your medication cold. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, I, and, I, and I'll tell you why, because when I got off mine, the last drug I took, and I tapered off so slowly over several months with a doctor, okay, a homeopathic physician, mm -hmm. I still went through a drug withdrawal like you wouldn't believe. I went through seven months of drug withdrawal, just like a cocaine addict or somebody hooked on heroin. Seven months where I would walk down the hall and I'd just lose my balance and, or I'd, I'd have energy shooting up my body. I'd feel like I was on fire, um, couldn't sleep at night. When I first came off the drugs, I was up for 72 hours straight. I mean, these things... They, you know, the, the marketing hype is that they correct a chemical imbalance. Well, no, no. What they do is they cause a chemical imbalance. And when they cause it, then the body has to adjust to it because it's always looking for homeostasis. And if you do get a benefit out of it, it's because of your, you're kind of like numbed out while your body's trying to figure out what to do with these drugs because it's a foreign entity to your body. <clears throat> so after seven months, I finally made it out the other end. And when I made it out the other end, uh, what happened, and, I, and this is another long story, but I'm going to make it real short, is a repressed memory came up. And it was a repressed memory of uh, child molestation by a neighbor. I had been sexually molested. Now, what that had done to me was caused me to be predisp predisposed to negative thinking, caused me to uh, be depressed most of the time, it, my depression was real, don't get me wrong. For 23 years, yes, I was on the drugs, but there was real emotional issues underneath all this. There was real anger, hurt, pain, fear, shame, grief. All that was there. It was there. And that's the other thing I want to warn people about. If you think you're just going to come off these drugs and it's all going to be happy, go lucky, don't do it either because you got to deal with whatever the underlying cause is, whatever the underlying reason that you started on these drugs in the first place. So Jeff, I'm going to interrupt you momentarily. We need to take a brief commercial break. Mm -hmm. So, and that last comment plays directly into a question I wanted to be sure that we talked about today. So we're going to take a short break. When we come back, everybody, we're going to talk more about Jeffrey's pathway to being able to heal uh, many, many years of depression going in a non-pharmaceutical route and uh, the benefits and the potential pitfalls of that. So we're going to talk about that in his book when we come back. So uh, everybody sit tight 
and we'll be back and, and Jeff when we come back we'll we'll dive more into you know what depression really is and, and how to integrate your method with you know quote unquote traditional methods how to transition so you can be thinking about that while while we go to break. Okay. Thank you. Okay everybody, welcome back to Radio Free Spirit. This is Wednesday, October the 6th, and I'm your host, Jeff Lawton. Thrilled to have you here. And we've got a pretty rich topic that is on the hopper today. We are talking about different approaches to working with mental illness or mood disorders. And uh, particularly, we've been talking during the first half hour about depression. And my guest, Jeffrey Wilson, who is a uh, author and a healer, uh, former pharmaceutical industry executive. We were just talking before the break about the irony of that. Um, and Jeffrey has a wonderful book out called um, Irrational Medicine. Love that title. Irrational Medicine, the Antidepressant Crisis and How to Avoid Unnecessary Behavioral Drugs. And Jeff and I, before the break, we were talking about his story of him having gone through 23 years of being on pharmaceutical medications for depression and then subsequent diagnoses of ADD, bipolar disorder, and chronic fatigue syndrome. And uh, he began reaching a frustration level with that whole paradigm of treatment and started doing a lot of his own research. And right before we went to the break, he was sharing how he weaned himself with his support team, including a homeopathic doctor, weaning himself off the medications. And he warned people, and I want to reiterate this warning, if you are someone suffering from bipolar disorder, depression, anxiety, any major mood disorder, and you are on pharmaceuticals, then, and you decide that you want to try an alternative approach, please, please, please be sure that you do this in consultation with your doctor or your psychiatrist. Jeffrey used a homeopathic doctor. Do not do it on your own. It can literally be fatal. And the other point that Jeffrey brought up right before the commercial break, that's where I want to now pick up the conversation, is it's also important to realize that depression in particular, depression has emotional and I'm going to add energetic roots and causes. There can be biochemical components. But most of us that have ever dealt with depression, and I have as well, and I have family members that are um, that have mood disorders, so this subject is, is one that I've had to live with in the trenches with my own family. And the the thing is, is that it's not just a biochemical thing. And so, Jeffrey, that leads me to where I wanted to go next with our conversation is, you know, you, you ended the first segment on that note of, you know, if you think it's going to be a cakewalk getting off the meds or being off meds and doing these alternative approaches, you're still going to have to do the work. There's, there's work to be done. So you had mentioned before the break that you had done emotional release work, um, you had also done homeopathic work, um, so several different things you did for yourself, and you also were graceful enough to mention that one of the things in that work that you uncovered is that there had been a sexual molestation that you had gone through as a child that was a repressed memory. And, and so the question I wanted to get your opinion on is, if one is currently in a, for lack of a better word, traditional model of working with depression, so you're, you're being treated by a psychiatrist, you're on medications, 
maybe you're in therapy, maybe you're not. And you want to actually explore these alternative routes. Can you give our listeners uh, a basic preliminary roadmap about how they might do that? And, and of course, including what you're now teaching and, and, you know, the vibrational healing work that also ended up being a big part. So walk, walk people through a possible path and how they would do it in a way that they don't hurt themselves making the transition. Hmm. Yeah, well, that's a, that's a huge, huge question. And I would start out by saying that for everybody, it's a little bit different. So I'm going to give you some very high level generalities. Great. Um, but the big, the two biggest things, absolute key, is one, you need to give up the idea that depression is a disease. Okay, that's what we've been promoted to, marketed to, uh, taught, so forth and so on. It's not a disease. It is, you're right, it is a biochemical, it can be a biochemically based imbalance, but that's the last manifestation of energetic imbalances. And it's not a disease like we've been taught, like, um, heart disease or cancer or something like that, what, what it is, it's a symptom. It's a huge symptom that you've got an issue. You've got a problem. There's an imbalance in your life. And so your spirit is saying to you, wake up. I can't get your attention any way else. You know, as I look back and was writing my book, I could see over and over and over again how spirit, how the creator tried to get my attention. And I ignored it. So finally the universe slapped me with depression. And so that's, that's what you got to understand. So having said that, it's not fatal. It's not permanent. It's, it's something that can be dealt with. But that leads me to the other part, and that is you've got to do your work. You know, and I did my work uh, by going to personal growth seminars, discovering who I was, taking a look at my emotions, taking a look at how I showed up in the world, how I didn't show up in the world, taking a look at where I was in, in integrity, but for the most part where I was out of integrity with the people in my life, the people that were supposedly meant the most to me. Also in my job, you know, I was a workaholic. Well, in retrospect, what that was was I was looking for my boss's approval. So it's a whole series of things you've got to do. So the bottom line is depression is not something that you're going to catch from somebody. Depression is a sign, a symptom that says, wake up, you need to pay attention, you need to see what's going on. Now, the other thing is it's also very real. It's very real. It can put you in bed. It can debilitate you. It can knock you off your feet to the point where you're not even functional in society anymore. And in that regard, sometimes, and I'm going to say very few times, but sometimes a pharmaceutical drug can be of benefit, all right? But you've got to take the approach that it's like a broken leg. You go to the hospital, you're on the ski slopes, you break your leg, you go to the hospital, they put a cast on your leg. In a few weeks, the bone knits back together, and then that cast comes off, and then you walk without the cast. And that's kind of like what you could use a pharmaceutical drug for if you absolutely have to. If things are so bad, if you're so down in the doldrums and things are so dark that you're ready to commit suicide, maybe, maybe for a short term, an antidepressant is the answer. But what the problem is, is that people get into the medical system, and I've seen it over and over and over again by people who have come to me after the fact, and they get into the system, and the system doesn't know how to get people off. The system has this mindset it's a disease and it's a lifelong event, and they just keep piling drugs on top of drugs. So you've got to go into it with the thought that it's temporary, life preserver, it's a a cast, and that you're going to do your work, and that you can heal, and that you can beat this. That, you know, you bring up another good point in that answer, and and I realized I gave you the, you know, huge elephant (laughs) question but the you know I remember years ago when I was first starting to get trained as a coach and and in doing healing work I had a a workshop facilitator who said that you know depression is literally depressed energy you know mm-hmm. energy being kept depressed and repressed 
-hmm. And it oftentimes has a lot to do with repressed rage. Um, and of course, on the other side of rage is always a, a pretty deep level of grief and pain. Mm -hmm. Which, of course, is not the kind of thing most of us wake up every morning going, yippee, I get to go into my pain today. <laughs> but it, uh, the, I think one of the key things from what you said, Jeffrey, that I really want to make sure that our listeners take in, and, and any of you who have been regular listeners of my show, you've heard this theme before from other people that we've had on over the last eight months, no matter how hard you try and avoid doing your own inner work, you can't. I mean, if you really want to grow, this is my opinion and my experience, if you really want to grow, part of what has made your journey, Jeffrey, possible is because you, like me, you got in there and did the work. And, of course, I have my own judgment that the pharmaceutical industry and the medical profession they push drugs like this kind of blindly or, you know, almost automatically because it also appeals to that part of the mind that wants to say, oh, if I can just take a pill, then I don't have to do the other work. Just give me a pill to make it all better. Just like if, if a pill came out that said you could lose 30 pounds without ever exercising and eating all the cheesecake factory cheesecake you want, you know, it'd probably sell a gazillion prescriptions. So the, the, doing that inner work really is a crucial part of it. And so in your book, you know, you've written a book, and I want to make sure that we have some time here because you've got about nine minutes left. Talk about the book a little bit. You know, you, you went on this journey. You did this inner work. You learned a lot of different modalities. And so tell me a little bit about the book and and... Again, if you can summarize an entire book in a few minutes, you know what what will people be able to learn and get out of the book? Well, the, the biggest thing in, in, that they're going to get out of it is that there's hope. There's hope, and there's always hope. There's always something that can be done. I don't care how bad a situation is, and I'm not talking now just about depression. I'm talking about any affliction because. Ultimately, everything we go through, whether it's depression, cancer, heart disease, anything, you name it, is an energetic imbalance, it is an energetic imbalance. And if you can go to, if you can find that and correct it at, at the appropriate level or remove it, your body can heal itself. And that's what I did in the book. I go into great detail about uh, how I went to different alternative healing providers and all the things I went through. And the book is combination memoir and expose, so it, it goes into great detail of that 23 years and what led up to it and how I got off and so forth and so on. But the book is now incomplete in a certain level. I need to go back and do another version. I'm, I'm sure I'm working on a second book somewhere. But uh, what, I, what I did is after the book came out is toured the country talking to folks and I would have people come up to me after a lecture and say, hey, I read your book, and I got off. I broke free. And it's like, wow, that's awesome. And then I had other people come up and say, I read your book, but I can't do what you did. I, I don't have the time. I don't have the money. I don't have, you know, all this other stuff. And I said, okay, that's all right. Uh, you know, when, it's, when you're ready, things will click, you know, because in there there's a roadmap to healing if you want to go that route. And there's a quicker way to it, though. And that's, I, that's my, the rest of the journey that I need to write in book number two is I kept sitting here asking, how can I help people do what I did quicker, faster, with less effort? I mean, you still got to do your work. You still got to want to heal. You still have to choose. But ultimately, we are amazing creatures. We are so powerful beyond measure as human beings. I mean, and you know this. We've had this discussion. Mm -hmm. And we are powerful beyond measure. And if we can only get out of our own way, we can heal ourselves and we can address our own issues. And so that's set me on this path, and I started studying vibrational healing and energy, energy healing, energy medicine. And now what I do is 
instead of making people go through the massage, the hypnotherapy, all that other stuff, what I literally can do is go into people's body, mind, field complex at the etheric level and remove negative emotional charges, remove things that are blocking them from getting the energy of the universe, remove uh, what's keeping them down or holding them back from, first of all, wanting to do their work, second of all, from realizing what the problem is. I had a client last night. She had an obsessive compulsive disorder, and she says, I, 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 want, I want to understand what's going on here. And I did some work on her, and before I was finished, she looked at me and she goes, oh, I want to be in control of my life, and this is the only way I can control it. I said, yeah, that's right. Boom, mm-hmm. it was that simple. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I've, I've had uh, cases of, uh, had a young man who was suffering from depression, but the underlying cause was cancer. He had been given a death sentence. I worked on him vibrational at the etheric level, and I just talked to him two nights ago, just as a, and this is three months ago that I was introduced to him. Talked to him two nights ago. He had just got done moving refrigerators all day. 23-year-old who had been told to go home and die, you've got cancer, there's nothing we can do for you. And now the man is out living his life again, okay? So it, it's all energetic. It, everything is energy. Everything, whether you, whether you take a rock and you put it underneath an electron microscope and, and there's more space in there than there is solid matter, where you take your watch, your desk, anything, it's all energy. We're energy. But what happens is that the world impinges on us and shuts us down and stuff gets in our field. And, and like sexual abuse got in my field, it blocked energy from the creator of all that is. The growing up in an abusive childhood or an abusive home as a child blocked the creator of all that is. So I had all these blocks and barriers in my field. And once those got removed, the energy of the creator was able to get into my field and then consciousness came into my field and I was able to let go of the depression. I was able to let go of the chronic fatigue. I was able to let go of the ADD, the bipolar disorder, all that stuff that was holding me down. I did it a very physical and manual way uh, with different healers and practitioners. I have since figured out a way to do it at the energetic level. So that's why I can't give you a one, mm-hmm. one size fits all answer, but I can tell you this much. There's always something that can be done for somebody, always. Well, and I think that's a, a great, a great place to begin to segue into closing out today's show. Is there is always something that can be done, and at, at the very least, whether one would agree with that or not. I would I would word that slightly differently to say the same thing, which is there's always there's always a possibility that we usually don't think of. And in the field, my experience having someone dear to me, um, having gone through the mental health system and the medical system, is you know there's often amazing things that can be done on the road less traveled, and so. To just blindly take any doctor's word for it in anything. I mean, this is a bias I have about medicine in general. But, um, cause I, I think doctors are valuable, particularly if you have a good one, but you don't take anything blindly. Jeffrey's been talking about, you know, making room for consciousness and making room for your connection to spirit, whatever that might be for any of you. But there's always there's always possibilities that you may not know about and to explore that rather than going into resignation or uh, some sort of futility is the way to go in, in my opinion and, and Jeffrey's book is, is uh, an inspirational proof that it can be well worth not only doing the inner work that you to do but that there are incredible alternatives that can be out there that not all of which may be a fit for you, but they're certainly all worth checking out um, rather than just accepting that there is only one way to approach. So, 
Jeffrey, if people want to be able to take advantage of your mastery and your skills in these areas, what's the best way for them to get a hold of you and, and do you have any do you have any live events or workshops or talks coming up? Uh, yeah, well, the, the best way to get a hold of me is going to be through the website, and that's uh, www.jeffrey, J-E-F-F-R-E-Y, Wilson Heels, H-E-A-L-S, dot com. And uh, that's the best way. If you don't have access to the web, a phone number that you can get a hold of me at is uh, 828 367 Three six five seven, and uh, upcoming events. I don't have anything scheduled right now, but I'm I'm being uh, urged and nudged to get back out there and start doing some more group appointments where I actually do vibrational healing to 40, 50 people at a, at the same time. I also have private sessions available to, for folks if they want to take advantage of that, where it's about an hour and we have a first 30 minutes is a conversation where you just basically tell me what's going on and it doesn't have to be depression it has it can be any issue anything in your life physical mental emotional spiritual and then the first half hour is the conversation as we talk i literally get hits i mean i'm told by spirit or the creator what needs to be cleared from your field and then we do a clearing work in the last 20 minutes or so where i basically use sacred ge geometric codes to remove these blocks and barriers and then you go from there, you go out and you begin to heal yourself and realizations pop to the surface. Like you begin to understand why you do certain things or, or you begin to understand, yeah, this happened to me or 